Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Ritesh. This is Max and Justin, and along with Megan, who's in the audience, and Dr. Tyrone Porter in the Department of Biomedical Engineering. Um, we completed our senior project on constructing a nanoparticle to deliver drugs to, uh, across the blood-brain barrier to treat brain cancer. So central nervous system cancers include spine and brain cancer, and it's actually the most common occurring childhood cancer um, amongst all other cancers. There are currently 700,000 individuals in the United States living with any type of brain tumor, and brain cancer specifically contributes 14,000 deaths per year in the US. And it's pretty clear that brain cancer is not the leading cause of death, um, but it's actually our disease of interest because if you look at the graph below, um, despite the fact that over the past few decades, um, a lot of money has been poured into cancer research, the mortality of brain cancer has not decreased. Before we go forward, we'll just go over some quick terms that will become important as the presentation goes on. The first is siRNA, which stands for small interfering RNA. This is just our method of gene knockdown for killing our cancer cells. Um, it, it's a, a method to stop gene expression. The term lipid is just a fat molecule. Peptide is a small protein. And liposome is a lipid nanobubble, so a bilayer of the lipid to make a nanobubble um, around 60 to 100 nanometers shown on the right. So in treating brain cancers, one of the major obstacles is the blood-brain barrier. Uh, it's a mesh of blood vessels, uh, you can see a schematic, a sm sorry, a schematic of it on your left, um, that block nearly 100% of all drug molecules from getting from your bloodstream into your brain regions. While it's necessary to keep things like bacteria and viruses out of the brain regions, you can imagine it makes it very difficult for doctors to deliver drugs to the brain to treat those cancers or other central nervous system disorders. Um, on the right side, you'll see an image, an x-ray of a mouse. It was injected with molecules that help with the imaging of the x-ray, and so we can see most of the uh, structure of the mouse except for the brain regions. Um, that's because the blood-brain barrier was doing its job very well and blocked those molecules from getting in. So our team decided to uh, approach this problem in two ways. The first way was a nanoparticle. You can think of this as kind of a little molecular shell. Um, within it, it can hold drugs and that's how it delivers it. It protects the drugs from being degraded within the body, as well as allows us to target certain locations, locations within the body. Um, and you can see kind of the core of the nanoparticle um, is the green, it's colored green on the slide, and that's made of calcium and phosphate, which together hold siRNA, our drug of choice, uh, within that core. Around it, you'll see that bilayer, that lipid bilayer, which protects the, the core, and on the outside, you'll see little strings coming off of it. Those are um, angiopep, which we're touched, we'll talk about in a little bit. The second part of the project is a device. It's a microfluidic model, uh, which allows us to simulate kind of the um, blood flow that happens in your blood vessels uh, and gives us a more accurate and efficient way of testing uh, the nanoparticles outside of the body. So there's no need for human testing or animal testing. My part of the project focused on the nanoparticle, characterizing it and optimizing it. So I'm gonna walk you guys really quickly through how I make those nanoparticles. So you have your calcium and your phosphate, the things that make up that core, as well as your siRNA. You add those into their own individual solutions of oil and water, uh, to put those together, mix them up, and what you get is that the water droplets kind of separate out. The calcium and phosphate bind together to make that core holding the siRNA, um, and they're contained within those water droplets in the oil. You add in your lipids to make that layer around that core that you saw earlier, um, and you're left with the nanoparticles, which you can filter out from the oil and water um, and just have those uh, products. So important to note, the calcium is positively charged and the siRNA is negatively charged. So that's how the, the, cal the bonding of the calcium and phosphate are able to incorporate that siRNA and hold it within the core. I looked at a couple different aspects of the nanoparticles. Uh, this one is of the, rele the best release condition for the drug from the, from the nanoparticle. Um, I tested several diff different conditions, and as you can see, pH 6 resulted in the most amount of release, as quantified by the amount of fluorescence that our particular siRNA um, had. The second aspect that I looked at was the changing up the amount of calcium and phosphate. Um, and so as you can see, as you increase the amount of calcium to phosphate, we got an increase in amount of drug per nanoparticle, um, which is that loading efficiency percentage. So now that Justin perfected the inside of the nanoparticle, or the green part, the core that carries the drug, he then passed it off onto me, and I was in charge of coating that with our lipid bilayer, which protects the core as it enters the body, and also um, directing the nanoparticle to the correct place. Because again, the issue is that we can't get past the blood-brain barrier and into the correct cells. Um, we approach this problem by coating our lipid bilayer with a protein called angiopep. 
circled there. Um, and this protein was chosen because it's been shown that receptors for this protein have been overexpressed on blood vessel cells of the blood-brain barrier and brain cancer cells. Um, and in order to connect this protein to the lipid bilayer, we took advantage of a thiol reaction between a modified lipid we used in the bilayer and the po protein itself. In order to prove that angiopep, or the protein of choice, actually did its job in specifically entering the correct cells, we plated blood vessel cells in a 96 well plate. Um, and you see the cell nuclei are dyed blue in both images. On the left, we introduced liposomes, or those lipid bubbles, with the angiopep decorated on the outside. And on the right, we introduced liposomes with no angiopep involved. Um, and we saw that once the angiopep was conjugated or connected to the lipid bilayer of the liposome, um, cells were able to uptake the liposome. The liposomes are dyed red here, um, which, so it's very clear that the angiopep did its job. Once we saw that the angiopep did its job, we wanted to know how much angiopep to use in order to direct the nanoparticles to the correct place. Um, angiopep amounts were varied by varying the amount of lipid that it connected to in the lipid bilayer. We found that the more modified lipid we used, uh, the more effective transcytosis or cell, cell crossing um, was. So we decided going forward to go, with, go forward with the 1.5 mole percentage of our modified lipid as it increased permeability uh, with a p-value of less than 0.05. All right. So now that we sort of have this particle optimized and characterized and we can use it, we had to figure out how it actually works inside the body and what how it would behave inside a blood vessel in the brain. So we decided to make a microfluidic model instead of using an animal because it's cheaper, faster, and we think just a little better to do. So um, a microfluidic model is basically just pieces of plastic with little channels carved in it about the width of a human hair, more or less, and we could direct fluid flow to be any way we want. So in ours, ours is comprised of four parts right here. Um, we have a glass cover slip, which just sort of keeps everything together a PDMS microchannel, so PDMS is our plastic, and this channel represents our brain space. So we can line it with brain cancer cells, another cancer cell, it sort of represents what your brain would be. Then we have a membrane here that keeps the two halves together, and then a top PDMS channel that represents our blood vessel. So that's like blood flowing throughout your brain, and that we can line with blood vessel cells, just like the blood vessel wall, which is your blood-brain barrier. And so you can see that more clearly here in the cross section. So again, we have this blood vessel area, blood vessel cells, um, the brain, and some cancer cells. So any fluid that flows in the top here, let's say we put our nanoparticles there, it's like they're flowing through the bloodstream, and then whatever we see at the bottom is what got into the brain. So um, here's a picture of the finished device. It's about the size of a penny. It's right here. So they're pretty cool. You can come look at it later if you want. And here's a microscope image of the channels. So you can see that the lower channel here, which is smaller, sits right underneath the big channel, the top channel. So any nanoparticles that get into the lower channel that have killed a cancer cell are ones that have crossed through our blood-brain barrier. So now we wanted to figure out, well, if we can get this nanoparticle inside, what will it do? Can it actually kill a cancer cell? So what we did was we sort of did an experiment where we changed up. So instead of using um, brain cancer cells, we used breast cancer cells because they were available to us. And we had breast cancer cells that made a green protein. And we use this green protein to be analogous to, like, let's say, a mutant gene in a cancer cell that causes it to be cancer. So in our nanoparticles, the sRNA that Justin talked about was specifically targeted against the green protein. So if the nanoparticle did its job, we should see less green. And so we would, this uh, column here is the nanoparticles with the sRNA and with the angiopep, and we would expect to see less green in the bottom image. As you can see, compared to the other controls, it didn't really work out so well. So we think there's a few different problems with that. Possibly, we didn't have enough cells. We waited too long to take the picture. And the nanoparticles weren't uh, rehydrated properly. But we're repeating this right now with double the sample size. So hopefully, we should have some good results on Wednesday. But I think the important part is we were able to show that we could grow cancer cells and endothelial or the blood vessel cells at the same time for up to two weeks in the device, which showed that the device is working well as it's supposed to. And going forward, we think it should work out better. So to summarize, we've made a lipid-coated calcium phosphate nanoparticle that can encapsulate siRNA and specifically deliver it across the blood-brain barrier. We've also shown that adding angiopep to the outside of a nanoparticle can promote its ability to cross the blood-brain barrier. And we've made a model that we can use for rapid and fast 
and more effective testing of nanoparticles for brain cancer treatments. And we think putting this all together going forward provides a framework for future drug research in uh, brain cancer, but also other neurological diseases like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and epilepsy. So we'd like to thank um, Professor Porter in the Biomedical Engineering Department who runs the Nanomedicine and Medical Acoustics Lab and a few other graduate students listed there, KHC for a lot of financial support for the project, and Draper Labs who collaborated with us on the microfluidic devices. So thank you and we're open to questions. How would, how would you guys deliver the um, drug to like the blood vessels in the brain, like injection, like uh, pill, like and what kind of concentration you need in order to yeah. So we do an IV injection just so the, um, right now, a lot of people do brought, uh, nanoparticles for brain cancer, but they inject they implant a catheter inside your skull. So that's really invasive. So we're trying to just do a regular IV. And dosage, we would have to wait and see. So you'd have to use some animal models and move into clinical testing to get that. And it's hard to tell with the gene therapy as well. And the, the specific reason why these um, cells would go, or like the lipids would go to the brain is because of this like injury type? Yes. Yeah, so, um, uh, there's two reasons. So like tumors have leaky vasculature, so leaky blood vessels inherently. So that would already be in the presence of the brain tumor, and the angiopep will help it cross in that specific site. In addition, the sRNA can be um, right. you know targeted for a specific gene that say is expressed uh, only in cancer cells, giving it one more measure of targeting um, and make it more safe in general. All right. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.